Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. Apologies for not being on camera for this video, but quite frankly, I'm getting absolutely wrecked by hay fever. And that, plus the fact that I'm changing stuff in the background for when I'm next on video. Well, yeah, things are just kind of all over the place. With that said, we have a few very interesting stories to get through. And the first is a method by AMD. This is a patent to basically figure out how different tasks are going to be assigned in a heterogeneous, aka big dot little architecture. So back in the day, I feel ancient saying this, but... Zen 1, AMD made a really big deal of when it came to core count. If you remember, of course, back then, mainstream processors had four cores, eight threads on the Intel side, and AMD basically doubled this with Zen 1, with, let's say, the 1700X, having eight cores, 16 threads. And this has been very similar with also Zen 2, Zen 3. AMD have lauded their core count advantage over Intel, and it's much the same as well in HPC or, for example, Threadripper. But future processors are going to change things significantly because it isn't just going to be a matter of core count or, for example, chiplet designs, but also just in general power efficiency and the actual architecture of how chips are created, specifically in this big dot little environment, aka more accurately heterogeneous. I'm sure most of you know what this is, but I'll give you the gist just in case. But basically, high performance cores are used for tasks which are more complicated. So, for example, gaming, or if you're doing 3D rendering, those type of tasks would be offloaded to the uh, more powerful cores. And then if you're just idling on the desktop, you're using, for example, you know, a web browser, that type of thing, or if it's a phone, making a phone call, then the low power cores are used. And this, of course, has numerous advantages, one of those being that you're consuming less power. Kepler L2, I'll link his Twitter account in the video description, has found a very interesting patent, which actually seems to demonstrate AMD going in this direction for desktop. And AMD are not the first to do this necessarily. In fact, we believe that Intel and their older Lake processors will probably do very similar for their 12th generation. But let's stick to AMD. So this patent is uh, called Task Transition Between Heterogeneous Processors. And it was originally filed quite a while ago, actually. It was December 2019, so about a year and a half ago as of the time I'm recording this. So again, this is nothing else other than to illustrate how long architectures take to bring up. It's not something that you can just kind of be like, well, I'm sure that's fine, copy and paste and you know, into Photoshop and it's all done. It takes a long time to bring architectures up. And the TLDR here is that, and you can see this from the diagrams themselves, basically what the processor does, or rather the entire package, is ascertain how big of a job a certain task is, and then it can provide a means of switching that task from over the lower to the higher performance cores. And it will use a variety of different metrics to ascertain when and if that task should be uh, switched over to the high performance cores or indeed the lower performance. In this specific, um, I guess, slide diagram, uh, 610 is monitor one or more metrics associated with the execution of a task by a relatively less powerful processor. Compare at least one metric of one or more metrics to a threshold. Have you heard metrics enough yet? Here's a few more. Metric, metric, metric. Okay, let's, let's stop that. Relocate the task to a relatively more powerful processor based upon this comparison, and then execute the task on the relatively more powerful processor based upon the comparison. And of course, then it will continue to do this based upon the task. And again, there are a lot of different uh, examples here in this uh, diagram. And it's going to be very interesting when this comes to pass, because we believe this is going to be part and parcel of Strix Point for the Ryzen 8000 series. And if you don't know, Strix Point is for Zen 5, which is going to be built on the 3NM process. The timing of this is also quite curious because Intel's older lake will be on the market for a while, at least assuming that the roadmaps we've seen for either AMD or Intel are even remotely accurate. So more likely, we'll see this actually face off against Raptor Lake. So again, it will be very interesting to see how modern day applications 
especially more legacy applications will actually deal with this and also to see people testing things like latency, to see how games and applications will just kind of deal with this and also just how if applications can really peg a processor to see how either AMD or Intel leverage the smaller cores. Oh, and a small other thing, by the way, guys, and it's currently summer, so um, neighbors' kids are playing. I don't know if the microphone could pick that up, but I just wanted to let you know uh, people are not getting murdered in the background, I promise. And next up, core count. Speaking of core count, because Zen 4 is going to be increasing the core count, not to 96 cores, but possibly up to 128. Now, this rumor is actually from a few places. The first is Chip Hell. However, Vegeta is also stating the same thing, as well as executable fix. Now, it is worth noting that this does not seem to be for Genoa, which, of course, are the server parts, although at the moment it's still not 100% exactly what these SKUs are, which are the 128 cores. For example, Chip Hell is stating that it could be Epic processors, but others, such as Executable Fix, are stating that it's not for this at all. Executable Fix has also created a mock-up of Genoa, which it's, of course, very difficult to know how accurate it is. It looks very much like Rome slash Milan. But either way, there have been rumours for a long time that we're going to see 96 cores. Now, for Zen 5, I'm pretty damn sure it goes up to 128 cores. There's not a huge amount to say about this, other than there is basically doubt regarding the uh, core count of the Zen 4 for the highest end. Um, to be honest with you, 96 cores just a few years ago would have seemed absolutely ludicrous, let alone 128. And if it's true, and we do start to see 128 cores, whether it's for Zen 4 or Zen 5, I'm going to be interested to see how... Basically, you know, server um, providers kind of deal with this because obviously core density is a really big deal along with power consumption and heat output for servers, you know, server farms, obviously. So I'll be interested to see if this does spur on adoption because one thing I'm hearing quite a lot recently, and I don't know whether this is true or not, so I'm just going to throw it in here. I'm hearing some bad stuff about Intel's 7NM process. And a couple of people now have told me about it. Like, when one person tells you about something bad or good or any rumour, you're like, eh. But when multiple people are telling you the same thing, it starts to become, you know, something noteworthy. And again, a couple of folks now who have pretty good information generally have told me that while 10NM was, well, a meme, 7NM from Intel is not looking to be great either. I'm really hoping that this is not the case, but either way, it'll be very interesting to see whether this is true or not, particularly in light of, again, a higher core count from AMD, potentially anyway with Zen 4, but almost certainly Zen 5. And the final thing that I would like to discuss today is a rather interesting rumor concerning NVIDIA. Specifically, this revolves around the production capacity of Ampere. Yes, I know, I know, I know, production capacity, but still. Um, so there was a report from the website IT Home, and this is from a board channel forum. Now, from what I understand, this forum is closed, and it's basically for board partners and stuff, but basically the gist is anyway, that NVIDIA are now um, providing a notice to board partners, so that would of course be MSI, um, Asus, whomever, that it's going to be adjusting the way that it kind of allocates supply. The TLDR is that cards such as the RTX 2060, I'm going to repeat that again, the 2060, are going to be reduced in their supply, and instead NVIDIA are going to push more towards the RTX 30 series. Now, the first instinct you might have is, but gee golly, Paul, they're not even using the same process. You know, they're literally completely different dies, and this is true, but some of you who kind of thought about it for a second will also realize that that doesn't necessarily mean too much, because while this is true, they also have a lot of similarities. Um, for example, even the PCB themselves, VRMs, um, even the memory which goes on the boards, you know, there is so much stuff which is, well, basically the same, right? 
And much the same could be said, of course, for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox and all of this other uh, crap, that's a technical term, that is really popular at the moment. Although they are, technically speaking, very different in either their usage or design, they do have a lot of common components. So for NVIDIA to do this, it's basically somewhat freeing up production capacity of some of the other components. And this is a really crappy analogy because, well, you were going to use completely different tyres, but I'm sure someone who's more of a car guy could probably give a much better analogy in the comments. But, you know, it's kind of like saying, well, yeah, this Ford Fiesta it has very little in common with, let's say, this Tesla, but they require wheels. And I, yes, again, I know that the wheels are different, but, you know, it's the best analogy that I can think of when I'm tired and getting absolutely destroyed with Aviva. But you get the point. And so this is going to be hopefully freeing up supply in the chain. And the RTX 3060 was a, is a really popular card. Um, and I'm going to be very interested to see how this actually does affect things because we've been hearing that the shortages are going to get better and I do believe they will. I think that we are kind of cresting over the summit. I'm hoping so anyway because quite frankly it's it's really frustrating to deal with <laughs> just in general like you know even getting cards for review it's very frustrating because you're like I really want to be excited about this card, right? Like, it's really cool. Like, the RTX 3070 Ti was a very interesting product for me to review just recently because, you know, it, it was a card I was looking forward to for so damn long. Not because it was particularly interesting in terms of performance, but I was really curious to see how much of an advantage the, you know, memory bandwidth um, of the Ti afforded it and to kind of play around with it, which I did a bit for the review, but... I kind of got a part of the way through the review, and I'm like, yeah, but I could put so much more work into this review, but, you know, a lot of you guys are just not going to be able to buy it. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, there was definitely a lot of burnout with the GPUs, and I do understand. So hopefully this will start to become a thing. I think that's also one of the reasons I'm much more excited about the, you know, RDNA 3 and other architectures, because by that point, things should be a lot better. Anyway, guys, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Again, I'm sorry for it being a bit hickledy pickledy. That's a fun word to say, isn't it? Hickledy pickledy. You don't really get to say that too much now. Well, I guess you do. But with that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.